We are on Zen, Velvet on Kumen, on Svetain. Uh, Interessant and good. Wir haben ein 31, ich habe schon warten noch eine Minute. Ja. Ich habe bis es kommt zu 50. Was, was, was tracht ihr, ja? Das ist fein. Ja, das ist fein. Ja. If it happens. Ja. Ich wollte gewinnen an täuscht euch nicht, weil ähm, ihr müsst doch schon geschrieben etwas. Ah. <lacht> Hast du gesehen, Stephanie? Ja. Yeah. Okay, noch a minute. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, we're going to start in a moment. We're, we're, we're seeing that people are still gathering, so we're just going to wait for uh, another moment or so. I welcome everyone. In the meantime, you are uh, invited to share your location with us. Let us know where you're joining us from. You can type it in to the chat if you like. Los Angeles, Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. Toronto. Raleigh, North Carolina, Scott Davis, hello. And yes, hi. Okay, so we have a few a few responses to where where various places in North America. So I think we're 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 not going to Los Angeles, of course, Henry Slucky. And Carol, okay. Um, well, I just don't want people to miss this uh, introduction, but I'm going to start um, Pacific Palisades, because that's Los Angeles. Yeah, shalom aleichem. Okay, so I'm I'm going to to begin. Uh, so everyone, seid, seid begrüßt, welcome, welcome. Uh, Shalom Aleichem. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to have a nice turnout for Dr. Stephanie Halpern's talk, Hindcast Forecast, how the Evo Vilna digitization project helps us grasp our present and future. My name is Miri Coral and as director of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language, I've had the privilege over the last 20 plus years of introducing hundreds of topics and speakers, each one illuminating a unique facet of the astonishingly rich Yiddish heritage. I'm very grateful for the co-sponsorship of the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, especially my counterpart, Vivian Felsen, because, um, well, it's always wonderful to join hands 
uh, across across national boundaries, right? Which is very much what Yiddish does in so many ways. Locally, I want to thank Del Nista, Los Angeles, for being our Zoom webinar host today, and Zachary Golden in particular, who is behind the scenes uh, technical director. And uh, we're, we're, we're pleased to have you joining us from many places across North America. So feel free again to type uh, into the chat where you're joining us from. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to my UCLA Yiddish film class students uh, who I hope are in the audience today. None of this would be possible without the support of uh, California Yiddish Institute donors and members. And I thank all those who've given your support and uh, we continue our programming. So look for an announcement soon. Uh, Mendy Kahan, the director of Young Yiddish will join us from Israel uh, for a look at the vicissitudes of promoting Yiddish in Israel. So I feel really privileged to be able to introduce Dr. Stephanie Halpern today. Stephanie Halpern is director of the archives at the Evo Institute for Jewish Research, where she has worked since 2016. She, received, she received her PhD from the Department of Jewish Literature at the Jewish Theological Seminary and has a master's in archival studies from Clayton State University. Stephanie has published on Yiddish and Jewish theater and performance, has a regular column about artifacts from the Evo archives in the UK-based journal Jewish Renaissance and was the assistant curator of the much lauded exhibition from the Bowery to Broadway, New York's Yiddish Theater, which was held at the Museum of the City of New York and really um, illuminated, highlighted um, this extraordinary aspect uh, contribution to New York City's cultural scene. Stephanie is an archivist archivist <laughs> from finding ways to preserve yellowed crumbling manuscripts to rooting around in boxes in dusty storage rooms to applying the latest technological tools. I'm also pleased to say that she has been a not infrequent guest for the cycle showcase of contemporary Yiddish culture. And we are so glad to have her with us today. Stephanie is going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers. So feel free as we go along to type your questions in the Q&A, and uh, hopefully we'll get to as many as we can afterwards. I'm pleased to present Dr. Stephanie Halpern. Thank you, Miri, for that introduction. Thank you for having me again. And, and thank you to everyone who is joining us for this talk today. I will just share my screen. The, the best way to learn about the Evo archives is to really be in it, but Zoom will have to do today. And um, I, I hope that the pictures that I bring you will, will give you a little taste of, of what we have here. So just to start, um, to sort of position ourselves. This is a picture here of uh, one of five stack floors that we have at the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research uh, in, in, in New York City, right by Union Square, uh, for those of you who, who have not been. Um, and if you can imagine it, the Yivo archives today has 24 million records um, in more than a dozen languages covering everything from manuscripts to sheet music to posters and artwork, artifacts, photographs. Um, and really we focus on everything from um, the greatest of the greats in, in Yiddish literature to the everyday letters that individuals um, sent to their family members um, and everything in between. And if you can believe it, we still receive two or three collections every single week. So. If anyone has materials to donate, talk to me after this. Um, and 
we don't just have materials um, from Eastern Europe. We don't just have materials from America. We have materials from all over the world. Wherever a Yiddish speaking Jew landed, we have materials from that country. The question though is, how did we get from our humble beginnings to, um, to these 24 million records? And the focus of today's talk, how did we come to digitize um, 1.5 million documents, um, which we just completed in January of 2020, just a few, few months ago. So I will take you on this um, very long and, and complicated journey um, and, and end with um, a demonstration on, on actually how to view the materials in the Edward Blank Yuvo Vilna online collections project. So first, a bit about Yivo's history. The Yivo Institute for Jewish Research was founded in Vilna, Poland in 1925 by scholars, intellectuals, lay leaders who really understood the importance of documenting um, and studying systematically uh, everyday Jewish life. But how do you do that? if you don't have the materials to, to actually study that. And so a core tenant of YIVO was actually going out and collecting these materials. Um, and YIVO did so in a number of ways. One of the most effective uh, was um, by sending out a series of questionnaires, uh, questionnaires on everything from holiday customs to, um, to to songs and children's games and um, stories about kings and queens um, and relationships between Jews and non-Jews. Um, and in a very short period of time, Yivo amassed a huge archive and library of materials. Uh, and they did so by employing um, a network of, of amateur collectors of Zomlers um, from all over the world uh, who went out with these questionnaires um, and who asked questions of informants. Um, and Yivo taught these Zomlers how to do this ethnographic work, um, ask the same questions of everyone, uh, find the people in the town or the city um, who know the most stories, often the oldest, often the most well-traveled, um, and explain to every single person that even if they have a story or a custom um, or a saying that they think their neighbor has, um, that is important. The way that they tell their story is important. Um, and so in this way, YIVO was able to collect um, all of these materials and to do, uh, to put out studies on them. And in a very short period of time, YIVO put out thousands of pieces of scholarship um, uh, on, on all of the materials that they had collected, um, showing both the outside world and the, the, the Jewish, the Yiddish speaking world um, that uh, Yiddish culture was important. YIVO continued to collect um, uh, until the outbreak of World War II. And um, like all cultural institutions across Europe, um, YIVO was looted um, by, by a special Nazi task force um, sent to, uh, to, to loot Jewish cultural material to decide what would be destroyed and what would be sent to um, the Institute for the Study of, of the Jewish Question. And um, the Nazis come, move into to, to Vilna, they establish um, the Vilna ghetto um, and they use YIVO as a sorting and processing center for all of these looted materials. But the Germans don't necessarily know what's important to keep and what's important to pulp. And so they put into forced labor um, a, a group of men and women, many of whom actually are affiliated with YIVO, to travel from the Vilna ghetto to the YIVO building, which was, was outside the bounds of the Vilna ghetto, every single day uh, to inventory the material, um, to stuff shipping to, to, sh to pack shipping crates that would be sent to Frankfurt to the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question and to decide what would be uh, what would be sent to the pulping mill. And these men and women decided um, that there could be no way that they could allow all of these materials to be destroyed. Um, and so they began 
smuggling materials um, in an attempt to save them. Uh, some members, uh, you know, put extra materials in these shipping crates bound for Frankfurt in the hope that, you know, no one would know what was in it anyway, that these materials would, um, would, would, would be saved after the war. And other members um, began smuggling materials on their person out of the Evo building and into the Vilna ghetto and burying these materials in bunkers around the city. Now, these group of men and women were, were called uh, the paper brigade, um, and uh, it was not necessarily a flattering term. Um, smuggling was happening in the ghettos, uh, but it was food, it was arms. Um, people thought smuggling paper, um, smuggling books and documents, what, what was the point of that? Um, and But, but the, these members of the paper brigade um, really believed that if they could save these uh, the, the, the cultural treasures, even if, um, even if uh, Jewish lives were destroyed, Jewish history still would, would remain. Um, to complicate matters a tiny bit, uh, uh, the, the YIVO um, in, 19, in 1939, Max Weinreich, the, the founder, one of the founders of YIVO, uh, was out of Poland um, at the time uh, at a linguistics conference. And he was told, do not come back to, to Poland, go to America. Um, and he went to America and he went to the American branch of, of YIVO. YIVO had branches all over, um, all over the world at that point. And uh, he, they were able to move the headquarters, the YIVO, the headquarters from Vilna to, uh, uh, to New York in 1940. Um, so just keep that in mind for the next, the next bit of our story here. The war ends and uh, the question is what has happened to these materials? Um, and uh, a large portion of materials that had been sent by the paper brigade to Frankfurt uh, was, was found. Um, and uh, some of you may know uh, the Monuments Men um, they open these crates and they see that there is evil material. Of course, it's not, not so simple as that, but, um, uh, uh, but eventually Yivo uh, learns of, Yivo in New York learns of um, the existence of these crates of materials. And Max Weinreich uh, works for several years um, to, to prove that Yivo in New York is uh, the successor to Yivo in Vilna and is able to, um, uh, to, to prove to the United States government that these materials, their rightful home is now in Yivo in New York. And in 1947, these crates, which amounted to uh, over 1 million pages of, of documents and thousands and thousands of volumes of books are repatriated to New York um, in 1947. And you see here um, this picture of what uh, of what these shipping crates um, look like. And in fact, um, at the time, YIVO did not have uh, a place for these materials um, to go. And so the, uh, the Manischewitz brothers uh, allowed YIVO to, for a time, to keep these crates in their, um, in their warehouse in New Jersey until YIVO was able to go through these, these materials and sort them and bring them um, to the YIVO building. Uh, in addition to that, um, there were uh, 13 days after the liberation of the city, two of the surviving members of the paper brigade, uh, the poets Avram Suskever and Shmerka Tatraginsky, who survived the war, um, they go into the, the Vilna ghetto and they actually go into these bunkers where YIVO, where YIVO materials had been hidden by the paper brigade and they dig up these materials with the intent um, of creating a uh, Jewish museum in, in Vilna, um, now under the, under Soviet rule. Um, it becomes very apparent very quickly to Sutskovar and Katraginsky that um, uh, the Soviets have no interest, uh, no real interest in Jewish culture. Um, and when it is clear that these materials will um, start to be destroyed once again by the Soviets, uh, Sutskovar and Katraginsky begin moving these materials that had been saved uh, in, in the Vilna ghetto, in these bunkers, to various places, 
um, and many of them are hand delivered to Evo uh, in New York City. So for many, many years, um, Yivo thought that the, those million or so documents uh, from the Offenbach Archival Depot and those from uh, the bunkers in the Vilna Ghetto were all that, that, uh, all that we had here um, until uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, when it came to light that a large, um, about 250,000 pages of documents were actually hidden in uh, the Book Palace, which was uh, in, in, a, uh, in a church in Vilnius, you can see here, um, that these materials uh, had been hidden by a Lithuanian librarian, Antanas Ulpis, um, and that he and anyone else who worked with him had kept this a secret for, for all of these years from uh, you know, the 1940s and until, uh, until the, the late 80s. Um, and Ivo traveled to, uh, to Vilnius on many occasions, um, in an attempt to uh, try to get the materials back, which they were unsuccessful um, in doing. And then in perhaps an attempt to get photocopies of these materials, um, which they were also largely unsuccessful in, in doing. Um, and, and, um, and for decades at, thereafter, Yivo knew that these materials were there and knew that they had very little access to them in Vilnius. Um, and then in 2013, it was decided that we were going to put aside questions of ownership, right? Who these materials belong to. The Lithuanians believed that they were Lithuanian cultural treasures. Yivo um, knew that, uh, that they had been collected by us before the war. Questions of ownership were going to be put aside and we were going to start a large scale digitization project to, if we couldn't recover the physical materials, to at least recover digital um, copies of them. And the Edward Blank Yivo Vilna online collections project was born. Uh, and before I, I go into the details of that project, I will just say that um, in 2016, and then again um, in 2017, Additional materials were discovered um, at the Lithuan at the Vrblevsky Library of the Lithuanian Academy of Sciences, and uh, also at the um, the National Library of Lithuania. So by 2017, we uh, YIVO was in partnership with with three um, three Lithuanian institutions, um, all of whom had had these YIVO materials since uh, uh, since since World War II. So the project, which was a seven year, $7 million endeavor, um, in the end uh, digitized over a thousand linear feet of archival material, about 1.5 million pages of documents to, and 12,000 volumes of books, um, all of which are now fully discoverable and um, accessible online um, in, in, in the form that we have them in their archival boxes. And uh, what is really unique about this project um, is that YIVO have, has documents uh, that for decades were missing a page or two. Um, and in many instances, those pages uh, have, been, have been located in one of our um, three uh, Lithuanian partner institutions. And so for the first time you can uh, you can actually access those missing pages. Um, just a quick highlight of some of the materials um, in the collection um, to sort of whet your appetite to, uh, to, to, to do some discovery on your own after this. Um, but we have a, a large collection digitized of of the first materials that Evo collected, um, those materials we collected via the forms of questionnaires, um, stories, uh, folk tales, songs on anything you can think of, love, death, drinking. Um, and uh, a, a personal favorite of mine, a story with a bear uh, about um, uh, a rabbi and his wife who have three children. Um, they go out for the day. The children are left alone, and it's actually this one right here. Uh, the children are left alone, and a bear comes up, is very hungry, gobbles the three children up. 
the, the rabbi and his wife come back. They don't know where their children are, but they hear them yelling from somewhere and they realize that they are yelling from inside the bear and they don't know what to, the rabbi and his wife do not know what to do. So the, the wife says, I have an idea. She gives the bear a lot of food, a lot of alcohol. The bear falls asleep. Uh, as the bear is snoring, they cut the bear open. They pull the children out. They fill the bear's belly with stones and bones so that he will be none the wiser. He comes to, he stands up, he has such a stomach ache and he says, oh, stones and bones are rattling in my belly. So in this collection, you can, you can find several variations of, uh, of a story with a bear. Um, and what's, what's, what's also amazing about the, the, um, the, the collection of ethnographic materials is that they're written on, as you can see from the screen, many, many different kinds of paper in many different hands. Uh, you know, the, the Zomblers are, are writing down these stories that they're, that they're hearing. Um, and a personal favorite of mine is this. Um, you look at it from the front, it's a map of, uh, of uh, Jewish agri agricultural colonies um, in Belarus uh, in the, the mid-1920s. And then you turn it over um, and you see uh, this very intricate, written uh, story on the back, which if you're interested in reading, you can look on our uh, online and actually blow it up so you can you can read the words. Um, we also have a large collection of autobiographies of, of Jewish youth in Poland. Um, in the 1930s, uh, Yivo ran a series of autobiography contests in 1932, 34, and 39. Um, and the idea was uh, if Yivo wanted to study um, youth culture and youth life, they needed to go directly to the source. Um, and so they ran these contests um, and there would be prizes administered for the best autobiographies um, and, and uh, individuals were encouraged to write as accurately as possible to um, just, just like the Zomlers encouraged uh, uh, their informants to um, uh, to tell stories in the way that they tell them, not in a literary way, um, in, in, the, in the true way that they would write, um, these, these youth were, um, were asked to do the same. And, um, and over 600 um, entries were received over the course of these, um, these three autobiographies. Uh, part of the prize was, was um, having your autobiography printed in, in the newspaper. And so Yivo knew um, that they needed to give um, uh, anyone who was, was writing the opportunity to, um, to write under um, anonymously or under um, a, a pseudonym so that they would, they, would, they would write honestly. They would not fear that you know, members of their town or, or family members would, would ever see what they've written. Um, and these autobiographies are wonderful because they really show the, the range of, of Jewish life, right? Everything from, from uh, religious to secular, um, from those going to, um, to school to, the, to those working, every range of um, political movements you could imagine and youth movements. Um, and of course, you know, uh, you have individuals writing about, um, about poverty, about war, about pogroms, but you also have people who are, um, teens who are simply writing about the stuff of everyday teen life. So um, I held hands with a girl, don't tell anyone. Um, I, there is, uh, I have a crush on someone, but they're not Jewish. Um, I, there's a great autobiography about um, a, a, a kid who, um, who writes about peer pressure. So he falls in with a group of, of kids and um, they, uh, they, they like stealing. And every single time they take him on a, you know, a mission to rob a store um, and there's some excuse that he has. But one day he's tricked into, into stealing from a shop and before he knows what's even happening, he grabs money from, you know, from a basket and he runs out and he feels so guilty that he never speaks to those friends again. Um, and, and, and decides at that moment that his life is, is going to be um, sort of on the straight and narrow. Um, and I'll tell you one other story about these autobiographies. Um, they, th there's a, one of the, one of the teens um, writes in her first lines, um, I have nothing interesting to say 
um, but I'm going to write down um, everything about my life anyway. Um, and uh, she starts uh, by saying before she was even born, her parents attempted to get divorced twice, um, but they were unsuccessful. Um, and then she was born and she is the reason uh, for the, their, their unhappy union to have continued. And so even a person who thinks I, I'm not a good writer, I have nothing to say, opens with those lines. Um, and you know that what is going to follow is, is going to be amazing. So about 300 of these survived the war. We have them at Evo, 300 of the autobiographies. Um, and uh, and what, what I was saying earlier about pieces of um, material showing up in, in, in Vilnius, um, it's sort of most prevalent with the autobiographies. And so our archivists in New York and the archivists in Lithuania who were working on the autobiographies actually sat together and they, um, they, they compared stories, they compared handwriting, and they were able to, um, to say, oh, that's page 48 of, of so-and-so's autobiography. Um, Uh, other amazing collections that I, I, uh, I love are, are those um, about uh, health. Um, we have an amazing collection um, uh, from Tzemach Shabbat, who was a doctor um, of thousands and thousands of medical records, if anyone out there is interested in medical history. Um, but we also have the records of OZE, the Society for the um, Protection of the Health and Welfare of, of the Jews. Um, and um, they put out a lot of manuals, lectures, um, uh, flyers, um, pamphlets about how to stay healthy. Um, so lectures on, on scarlet, um, scarlet fever and, and, um, and measles. Um, we have an amazing poster on something very health related, um, the, the good effects of hypnotism. Um, uh, they, they did a whole breastfeeding campaign. You can see this um, little stamp down here. Um, and so if anyone has any interest in, um, in, uh, in learning about health organizations and health practices and hygiene practices, um, this is an amazing collection. Um, remember to always wash your hands too. <laughs> uh, uh, collections that are particularly um, close to my heart um, are those on uh, theater and music. Uh, we have the, the collection of what's called the Esther Rochel Kaminska Yiddish Theater Museum collection. For those who know Esther Rochel Kaminska was one of the, the, great, um, the great Yiddish theater actors. And in 1926, um, a, a collection was, was, was begun in her name. And it includes thousands and thousands of, um, of playbills, of scripts, um, of posters, amazing theater posters, um, about 2000 of them from this collection, which are, are available online. Um, and what is really interesting about um, the Estrebochel Kaminsky Yiddish Theater Museum collection is that theaters from all over the world are sending their materials to Vilna. Uh, from 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 1926 and into the late 1930s, and so this is sort of the most comprehensive snapshot of the global uh, the glo a global view of Yiddish theater. Um, and so, what I've done for you here is actually um, uh, these are all uh, um, pieces from um, uh, the Kishif Macharin, uh, Bobby Yachna, as it's sometimes uh, uh, called um, by Abraham Goldfaden. Um, and so in this one collection, and this is only a, a portion of what we have on, on this play, but in this one collection, you can see um, playbills uh, from, from Brazil, from, from Poland, um, from America. And this right here is the handwritten score of that of that operetta, um, we have about 700 um, handwritten scores, and so um, our our colleagues at the Volksbühne actually used these collections to recreate the score and libretto of, of the Kishif Macharin, and they performed that uh, several years ago, but pre-pandemic times. Um, and so this is a collection for music scholars, for musicologists, and and for performers as well. Um, if you want to discover. Uh, the great Yiddish 
uh, the great unknown Yiddish operetta. Um, this is the this is the place to go. And and in our collection, you can find the music and and the libretto. Ah, personal favorite of mine. Um, materials from um, the, the Yiddish school systems uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. These are all notebooks um, from Tsisho. Uh, and, you know, um, what's so amazing about this, and, and I think something that is oftentimes uh, a revelation for individuals is that you have secular subjects um, being taught in Yiddish, but this, this was the um, uh, uh, this was the goal of, of these school systems. And so you have things like botany um, and, uh, and science and math um, and history, not just Jewish history, um, all contained in these notebooks. Um, the botany ones are my favorite, this beautiful, um, these beautiful drawings here of, of a fern. Um, but we have anatomy notebooks. Um, and, and of course, I mean, I've chosen the very, the very visually beautiful, but we also have the actual records of these of these schools too. Um, and so, anyone who's interested in learning about the inner workings of these school systems and the ideology behind um, a lot of what they're doing, uh, these are the collections to go to. So, for those of you. Um, who were who are wondering about the types of materials that were saved by the paper brigade? Um, they sort of by, by the paper brigade uh, smuggled into the Vilna ghetto and then and then um, dug up. Um, they fall into two categories. The first are historic um, and literary manuscripts; those materials that Yivo. Um, had before the war that the paper brigade felt were both small enough to smuggle into the Vilna ghetto and also uh, that were the most precious. Um, and so in this collection, we have materials uh, from Mendela. Um, we have uh, Ansky's uh, original Yiddish manuscript of the Dybbuk. And I say original in quotes because um, for those of you who, who who know or, or who don't, uh, this will be a good story for you. Um, Anski writes the Divik, right? The, probably the, the most uh, uh, famous Yiddish uh, play ever, ever produced. Um, he writes it in Russian and he translates it into Yiddish. And that actual original Yiddish manuscript is destroyed in a fire. Luckily, the poet uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik had um, translated Anski's Yiddish into Hebrew. And so Anski took Bialik's Hebrew and then translated it back into Yiddish. And so what we have here are, uh, in Anski's own hand are those pages um, that, he, that he wrote, that he translated back. And it's not the entire manuscript, um, it's about 18 or 20 pages of it, um, but, uh, but able to be seen online and take note. Um, it's it's particularly easy to see here. Just take note of uh, of how damaged it looks um, because we will talk about um, how how we deal with that. Um, and this here in the middle are a few pages um, of uh, the diary uh, written by Theodor Herzl from 1882 to 1884 before Herzl is Herzl um, in, in sort of the world, world's eyes. And uh, this is a diary of, um, of books that, um, that he's, he's reading. Um, and you can sort of see in this diary, thoughts um, are sort of coming together about the need for, uh, for a Jewish state here. Um, so any Herzl enthusiasts, uh, this diary is for you. And then we have um, many documents that the paper brigade were actually collecting in, in the Vilna ghetto um, and, and burying these bunkers um, in, in sort of a very evil way um, of, of collecting these materials. And so um, we have many issues of the ghetto, ghetto Yudias, um, documenting goings on um, uh, in the ghetto each day. Um, uh, particularly 
uh, moving to read for for YIVO people today are um, the the, re the reports from the Einsatzstab Rosenberg, the the Nazi task force that is looting um, uh, looting these material YIVO materials, um, and so reports by the staff again, many of whom are YIVO people, having to write about the inventorying and the shredding, um, the destruction of of those materials that um, that they have uh, spent so many years collecting and saving. Um, uh, various ordinances by uh, the Judenrat, by the police inspectors, um, and then something um, from the um, uh, from the statistics department in the ghetto. Um, uh, and you know, you see out of all of this sort of destruction and despair, uh, the library, uh, the ghetto library being used. Um, and so we have many charts. Um, documenting the the number and the types of books um, that are in the ghetto library and the number of um, of individuals who are who are using these uh, materials. Um, so forty five over forty five thousand books uh, uh, contained in the in the ghetto library in in nineteen forty one. <clears throat> just a just a very small sampling of the one and a half million pages um, in this collection. And to be honest, it was difficult to choose um, choose ones to show. Um, so the process, um, because you don't just take a million and a half pages and take a picture of them and put them online. It's, it's much more complicated than that. Um, and so as you saw, um, in some of those documents, and as you see here, a lot of these materials um, uh, are in terrible, were in terrible condition. And so we have conservators um, who are tasked with going through every single page of materials, um, mending each of them, flattening them, uh, cleaning them, right? So uh, we go from uh, a program, a theater program before treatment to what it looks like after treatment. And it, it was very, very, I'll, sh I'll show you. This is a poster which was in quite terrible condition um, and then mended uh, to the best that, that we could. And, and it became very apparent very early on uh, that it would not be possible, right, to, um, to take this poster and make it whole. Um, and so we decided that uh, what was important was making sure that, that all of as much information on a document uh, as possible was visible. Um, and, uh, and, and we know that a lot of these materials are so fragile that they're not going to last very long. A lot of them are, are made on wood, wood pulp paper, old newspaper um, type paper. For those of you who have picked up an old newspaper, it crumbles in your hands. Um, we knew that, that we could be the last people touching these materials. And so it was important to us to conserve them enough so that the photograph we take of them um, uh, could be as true a representation of these materials as possible. So everything goes through conservation and then everything is sent to our processing archivists who order, put, put the materials in order, describe everything and create what is called a finding aid, which I will, I will show you um, uh, how to, to look at and to navigate. And then only after everything is ordered and described do the materials go to our digital lab. Um, YIVO has uh, an in-house digital lab with three uh, setups of, uh, three setups that, that look just like this, a camera um, mounted on an overhead setup attached to a computer um, and we are able to capture 400,000 digital images uh, each year. Um, and it's, again, it's not just taking a picture. Uh, first, you take the photo and it shows up on the screen. And then the image goes through a series of cropping and, and post-production to make sure everything is even, um, to, to make sure that, <clears throat> um, that the image um, can actually be seen uh, on the screen. And then, it's got, every image goes through quality control. Quality control is taking the physical material and checking it against the digital image. So everything um, is looked at at least twice 
to make sure that it's as accurate a representation as possible. Then uh, the images go through what's called ingest or being linked to the finding aid so that they are actually able to be used online. And then just to be sure that we've done it right, all of the images then go through what we call quality control, which is um, going to the finding aid and making sure that when you open a folder that says theater programs, that's actually what you have inside of there. This is very technical. I have it here for those of you who are interested, um, but we don't just digitize for access, right? For the ability uh, for individuals to see everything online. We also digitize for preservation because remember these materials are in, in bad you know, physical condition. Um, and we wanna make sure that these digital files last forever or as long as forever as forever is. Um, and so, we make sure that we have three backups of, of these images um, in case one of our backups fails. Uh, we're able to, um, we, have, we have two others. Um, these backups go through a series of, of, of checksums, right, to make sure that the digital material um, is not corrupted in any way, right? Just like, um, just like paper materials break down, uh, digital materials can break down as well. And so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen over time. Um, and uh, if anyone is interested uh, in, in more of the, uh, the details, um, I can go into this later, but uh, in the, um, something that I always get asked is, do you have all of this material in the cloud? And the answer is yes, we do, but we use cloud backup only as the third tier um, we do. We, we have we have hardline backup um, that's that's backed up daily um, of all of our server files uh, to make sure. Right, you want to have um, have your 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 backups of your digital images um, in in hardline and in cloud storage and also in geographic locations that are not in your building. So we have a server in our building. We have a server that is not in our building um, in the event that there's a flood and the server happens or some kind of natural disaster um, or some kind of man-made disaster. Um, and so you really want to vary that. For anyone who, who is interested in, um, you know, in, in, in preserving their own um, digital materials, this is, um, this is sort of the future of, of archiving now, um, where we have to be worried about the physical materials and also the digital files. And then um, all of our materials are discoverable via um, a, a search layer um, called Primo, which I will show you how to use. Um, and uh, um, you're able to um, then search them in a, what's called a finding aid. Um, and you see down here, all of the digital images are available online uh, for, for viewing, for download, for printing. We don't have any, any checks on that. We don't require any passwords. Um, it's, it's free for everyone to use. Um, and we encourage you to do so. And we also um, make these materials available across multiple, um, multiple uh, content aggregators um, so that the, as many people as possible can access them. Um, so because um, I know that, uh, that using an online system like this is new to many people, I would like to just go through quickly how to do a search, um, how to access these materials. Um, and then I will say uh, we have many written and also visual guides on how to do this on our Evo website. And I am happy to share with Zach and Miri so that perhaps you can send that out to everyone in attendance um, because this little demonstration may not be enough for some people I know. So let me just share my screen here. This is the, the Vilna Collections website where all of the digital images can be accessed through. Uh, so you'll want to go to vilnacollections.evo.org and it brings you to this homepage. For those of you who maybe aren't interested in the materials, but just in the story, um, this website gives a lot more information about the projects, some featured artifacts. So it's a nice thing to browse um, if you just wanna, wanna, um, wanna learn more. Um, we have, for those of you who 
are interested in, in the range of collections, uh, you can go to browse the collections. And we have a list with direct links to the finding aid of every single collection that we digitize as part of the, the Vilna Collections project. Um, this is best for maybe if you already know, um, oh, I wanna see the pogrom material in the Cherokee archive, um, you can directly link to that. But for those of you who maybe just wanna do some exploring, um, you wanna use this search bar here. And we'll just use, we'll use theater as, as the search term. What's great about this search is that it searches across both archival documents, the archival collections, and also the books that are digitized as part of this project. Um, and so you see there are 40 results for collections or books that have the term theater. Um, it's just, I'll show you a, a, what a book looks like. So uh, we click on this link, it's Goldfaden book, and it opens out into what we call a catalog record. The catalog record gives you more information about the book, about the, the collection, about the author, the subjects it covers, uh, the publisher. And if you'd like to access this online, you click online access. And you can see on your screen an exact digital replica of the book. It's not in black and white. It, it hasn't been OCR'd. It is, it is the book uh, with all of its creases, um, with all of its writing. Um, and you can read that on your screen. You can enlarge it if necessary. And remember, you can also download and save, or you can print if you'd like. Let's go to the Esther Rachel Kaminsky Yiddish Theater Museum collection to see what it looks like to use an archival document. So again, it opens into the catalog record and you can click online access. This time it's going to open into what we call the finding aid. Now the finding aid is what orients you, what the collection has in it, the scope and content, his, a historical note about the creation of the collection, about the individuals um, who, who, who made the collection. And then on the side here, these links to the actual materials themselves. So you see series, sub-series one has plays and manuscripts, sub-series two has programs, plays by author. Um, you can click out and let's Let's click on Anski where we started on the Dybbuk. Let's continue with the Dybbuk. Click on the link. It opens you onto a page with this red icon, view the folder. Click that. And again, this opens to exactly what we have in our archival folders in, in, in New York. Um, and you're able to, this is, nice handwritten version with a lot of edits. Um, you're able to, to access these materials again, just like the book, uh, printing, downloading. A quick demonstration, but um, one that I hope uh, gets you going a little bit. Fantastic, Stephanie. Wow, thank you so much. I mean, you, you have, you know, created a treasury for future researchers. I bet you wish you had one uh, like this, right? When you were uh, rooting around in, in those dusty places. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's right, it's, that's right. But the rooting around in the dusty places got me to Evo, so absolutely. I'm thankful for that, yeah. <laughs> but it's really, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary piece of work that um, you guys, with you heading it, have, have contributed to the world, seriously. Um, and it's good to know the ways in which it's preserved, you know, for in the event of, of anything going wrong. I mean, we <clears throat> clearly, we, we, we know that none of us are on firm ground 
anymore in that regard. So that's extraordinary as well. Um, we, we have a few questions. I, I just wanted to start though by asking um, my own question, um, which is about the, um, the material, uh, so like the 300 biographies that remained, right, of the, the youth biographies, where, where were they, you know, where were they found? How did they, how did they get preserved? Sure. Uh, so the, the, the youth autobiographies uh, were those materials that were found in Offenbach that had been sent to Frankfurt um, and, and that were then recovered by, by the Monuments Men. And they were delivered to YIVO in 1947 and they have been with YIVO ever since available for researchers, but only ever on site. Um, and, uh, and now, as we all know, they are available for, for the world. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, and the collection that's in Vilna, that was in Vilna, right, in, uh, what did you call it, the, the Palace Library? The, yes, so the, the, the Book Palace, which is now the National Library, they took it over, yes. So, so is it, where, is it housed somewhere else now? Not, not, obviously it's not, not in it's, the church anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's no yeah. longer housed in that crumbling church, um, uh, which, um, I will just, as an aside, um, Antanas Ulpas's son, the Lithuanian librarian um, who, who saved these materials, his son re recalls a story where he was a very little boy and his father took him into the church and in, in he, he, the, the little boy, the, the son tried to play the organ and nothing, no sound would come out. And his father took him up and inside of the organ, uh, all of these these Jewish books and materials had been stuffed. So um, those materials are all now in a very beautiful building uh, uh, that was built for the National Library of, of Lithuania. So um, no longer stored in, in those uh, terrible conditions. And you saw, um, you saw the image of what some of those books and papers looked like. Um, uh, and was he keeping it secret because of this, the Soviets? Because he knew it, that they would maybe even destroy them. That's right. He knew that they definitely that they definitely would. Um, and he, in fact, hid a lot of these materials under uh, under books that he knew um, the censors would would look at and say, "Okay, no, no problem." Um, so they were shoved in the back. So I have more questions, but let's look at what what uh, members of our audience have asked. Um, so one question is um, re kind of relating to what we've been just talking about. Is Lithuania doing any conservation and restoration of the collections now as we speak? Not as we speak, no. They they had been doing them over the past seven years along with us. Evo funded, uh, funded that endeavor, um, uh, the 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 um, the conservation and the processing of, of these materials and then the digitization. Um, and so everything that um, is in Lithuania was was part of this project. Um, and so uh, so our colleagues there did a did a wonderful job um, at helping to preserve these materials. Yeah. So did they have the all the setups that you got like the same the camera setups and everything did they do that that way they have a they have similar setups different they they have a lot of flatbed setups um you know mm -hmm. book scanners yeah so someone asked a question um about uh translation of any of these materials so ha have any of these materials been translated and, and how do you decide what to translate or do you does evo decide what to translate I will say that um, that as an archival institution, our main, we're in the I will say in the archives, our main focus is um, is preservation and, and access to the original materials. And so the Evo archivists don't simply don't have the time to, to translate these materials. Um, however, we have um, other programs and initiatives that do help um, those who may not know Yiddish or any of the other. 12 languages that these materials are in um, uh, to, to access them so through public programs. Um, we have a, a, the Evo Online Museum, which um, has a small sort of 
um, fragment, not of not of the Vilna materials necessarily, but of Yivo materials um, that have been translated. Um, and of course, there are there are um, books that have been published by by outside scholars. Uh, the the youth autobiographies actually there's a, a good number of them um, that have been translated for anyone who who is interested. Um, but know that all of our finding aids are in English, um, and so uh, that hopefully. Um, is a layer that will not bar entry into the collection. And many of our materials are visual. Um, so photographs, thousands and thousands of photographs. Um, and so uh, you definitely don't need a language, you know, to, to access those. Um, and if you're interested in images of pre-war Yiddish life, uh, pre-war -pre Jewish life, um, the Lithuanian Jewish Communities Collection uh, has amazing, amazing photographs. Um, that are available. Thank you. Um, so Henry Slutsky asks, uh, can you tell us about the Evo in Paris? Mm. Was it was there a Evo branch in Paris? There was a branch, I think, a friends of of a society of friends of Evo. Um, uh, but I'm not sure much past that what um, Okay. There were many friends societies um, around the world, and those were collecting branches. And also, um, uh, what's interesting is America was never a collecting branch. It never it never gathered materials and sent. Really, it was a fundraising branch. Um, and so, many other societies um, uh, uh, actually sent materials to us. So. I, I don't remember the number, the, the, the huge number, right, of, of, of materials that Evo has. So where is this all stored? It can't possibly be stored in, in the building that you occupy in New York. No, well, so and you saw that, that first photograph of, of our stack floors. Um, that's a, a bit less than a quarter of our materials. More are stored in that building, if you can believe it. Um, and we also have a 12,000 square foot uh, warehouse in New Jersey, um, where we store mainly duplicates and, uh, and case files. Um, we have the case files of various aid societies, including um, HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. We have 250,000 Holocaust era case files um, uh, that, that we have stored in that warehouse. Um, so. Right. It's space, especially in New York, always an issue. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm always, we're always looking, it's like a, it's like a puzzle to uh, find where a box will fit, where a new collection will fit in. But at Evo, we always find space. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so Miriam Backrath, I think we, we, we responded to your questions, but um, is, is all the material that was in, in Vilna now digitized and merged? All of the material that we knew about during the course of the project. And what's amazing about this project is that more material is being discovered. Um, and so we already have partnerships with, with our Lithuanian colleagues to continue this project as, as new materials come to light. Um, and we will add them, we will continue to add them to the collection. Um, but the short answer is yes, anything that had been um, initially earmarked to be part of the project has been digitized. And um, um, I guess I, I just had a question about um, Beba Leventhal. Right. So something. So so her 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 diary appeared. Right. Um, so what happened there? You you guys did something amazing with that. We did. We did. Uh, Beba Epstein is was uh, as as we knew her. Um, so part of the discoveries that were made in Lithuania in 2017 included this this beautiful notebook um, uh, that was that was written by. Um, uh, Beba Epstein, who I believe when she wrote it was 10 or 11 years old. And it had this, um, this photograph of her on the front and Lithuania loaned us several pieces from these discoveries that were made in 2017. And we had them on display at New in New York and the New York Times came, they took a 
picture and they everyone had fallen in love with this you know photo of this little girl and so they ran that photo um in the story and we didn't know what happened to her we assumed we will would later find out wrongly that she had died in the war um and about a week later we got a call from her son uh, michael leventhal uh, and um he said actually you know, my mom survived the war and here I am, you know, and, and so this started us down a path uh, where Yibo created as the first gallery in its online museum, a story, um, uh, a, a gallery that really centered around Beba's story, um, telling the life of, um, of uh, the, the Jewish Vilna through, um, through Beba's eyes. Um, and so it's, it's very special. Um, and if you are interested, also available. And, and that is where many of the materials that have been um, translated live. Yeah, yeah, that's a kind of wonderful virtual virtual tour, which is uh, of, of the Vilna that was, yeah, which is pretty special, pretty special. Yeah, um, but I thought I was the one that told you about it, but that's okay. Um, so question, yes. But 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 Michael contacted Yivo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Uh, okay, so let's let's look at so a couple of questions in the, that wound up in the chat. Um, <coughs> one question, I guess, Zach is asking is, uh, uh, did you run across any materials about sports? Oh yeah. So interestingly, Yivo started a. Um, uh, had a call for for sports materials in um, in thirty five, um, right? He was always was always interested in in doing things as systematically as possible, and so um, we do. We have we have a lot of photographs and materials about um, various uh, uh, Jewish sports teams, Zach. So um, send me an email for uh, for where to find those. So you. You know, we've talked about what was preserved and mm -hmm. in the Papier Brigade and uh, and just the, the serendipitous finds after the war, uh, you know, and, and so forth. But do we have a sense of what was lost? Yes, we, we, we think it's probably less than a quarter of the, of the materials that Yibo had. What was um, lost was lost or that you have that we have that we have it's hard to estimate um because we don't have full listings of what were what was in the collections you know we don't have any any things that exist um uh in terms of donations um we in in large measure have had to piece together sort of through uh the evil yadias the the regular newsletter that went out which documented all of the um all of the donations everything that the zomblers were sending in but with no numbers necessarily um at that point during the war um only a small fraction of the tens of thousands of books that evo had in the library had actually been cataloged um and so it is uh it is difficult um it's difficult to say how much was lost but a, a great amount yeah Wow, so you may only have, even with all of this material you have, it might only be one fourth. Yeah, I know, that's the tragedy, but we have to focus on what we do have, I guess, which is amazing. Uh, and Philip Kuttner asks a great question, which is, do you work with um, the Yiddish Book Center, the Holocaust Museum, the Israeli ar um, archives? Israel archives so so as not to duplicate do you do anything like that or you share materials um yes yeah, so don't forget Yivo has been around now for almost 100 years uh far longer than um than some of these other uh institutions that we do work with uh, the Yiddish book center's main focus is is of course on on books um and we actually will send a lot of our uh, duplicate, have sent duplicate books uh, there because um, they have the capacity to, to handle and to deal with them and, and their online resources um, in terms of um, uh, 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 the books that are, are digitized is, is amazing. I use it a lot. Um, and uh, the Holocaust material, we have uh, provided many uh, 
many collections, many copies of collections to them. Um, and uh, the, the, I, I, I don't know if you're referring to the National Library of Israel or Yad Vashem or both, but yes, we also partner with them and we share digital images. Um, and, you know, what is nice about all of these institutions is that there is overlap between all our collections. Um, and so if you can't find something at EVO, um, you can probably find it at one of these other institutions or, or vice versa. Um, and so, you know, there's no, no reason ever to be in competition with, with our colleagues. Um, the materials should go where they can best be cared for, cared for and where there are the resources to make them accessible. Um, and so we, we try to, to partner with those, them in, in those ways. And of course we do, um, we do programming with, with all of these institutions as well uh, to share our knowledge um, and to share talks about our collections. Yeah. Well, I, I hope this talk will be, you know, we're, we're going to have this on our website. Zach, Zach is going to have it. Toronto will have it. Um, you know, so hopefully many people will be able to tune in and, and learn more about this amazing collection and, and how you can access it. Um, there was one last question from Jerome Hellman, which is, uh, you know, in terms of what you are collecting, because you said people are always, you know, sending you stuff, but uh, do you want like photocopies of, of letters? Can you handle those versus the originals that might be relevant to people listening? Sure. That's a, it's a really great question. Um, the, the answer though of course it, it varies case by case, is that we, um, we're in the business of preserving originals. Um, and so photocopies are, are generally not accepted. Um, if there are photocopies of things in a collection, um, we, we, you know, we, we ask donors um, oftentimes not to include those. Um, but if you have any interest in donating, please um, contact us directly. And uh, because I, I don't want to say no. And then um, uh, because, like I said, on a case by case basis, um, if there's something. So, so who should they? Um, who should they? So just um, I'm going to type because in. it's easy. Uh, mm -hmm. I will you, put it in, it in the chat. The, yeah. You can contact our reference services, reference at yevo.org. Whatever email you send to that mailbox, that will go, it will eventually, not eventually, within a few days, we'll get to the right person, whether that's me or our, our, our archivist who deals directly with donations. Um, we have a different archivist who deals with photographs, one that deals with sound recordings. Um, we have, we have, someone for everyone and everything at Evo. So, but, but please email reference. Um, and if you want to search the collections, um, you need more help uh, reference. And I will say, I know that many of you are far away from New York. Um, we are offering remote reference services uh, where we will meet with you um, on Zoom using a document camera and actually show you materials in real time um, for those, a million and a half pages are digitized and 22 and a half million are not. Um, so for those materials that are not, and, and we will actually um, take a certain number of free reference images for you that, that we are happy to, to send. Um, so if you have any needs, email reference at evo.org. Yeah, so this brings me to the last question. So what, what big project do you have next now um, that you, <laughs> well, you there's took a, a few months to rest, right? For there's that. no rest. We didn't rest, actually, Mary. Um, we just completed the digitiza thing, digitization the of the uh, Chaim Grada uh, and Ina Grada uh, collection. Um, so not quite as large as Vilna, about 105 or so thousand pages of manuscripts and uh, letters and photographs from Chaim and, and Ina Grada. Um, uh, we own the that that collection. We own the the um, that estate. Um, uh, Ina Ina Grada died, and there was no will. And Evo, um, along with the National Library of Israel, said, "Well, these materials can't be thrown away." Um, and so we purchased that. That's now online. 
we are in the process of digitizing the collection of uh, Nachman Blumenthal, who was a survivor historian. Um, and uh, he did a lot of uh, the early work on um, perpetrators of, of war crimes. His wife and young son were both turned in by members of the, the Blue Police, the, the Polish collaborating police, and um, were uh, murdered. Um, uh, they were trying to pass as uh, not Jewish. And Blumenthal, um, after the war, who he survived the war in the Soviet Union, um, immediately went and found the member of the, the Blue Police who turned his wife and son in and interviewed him. And that was sort of set him down a path. And we, in this collection are about 20,000 dictionary cards. Um, he, he had been creating a dictionary of, uh, of words and meanings that were perverted uh, during the war um, that the, the Nazis used um, as, as euphemisms, Nazi doublespeak. And then our biggest project that we are working on is the digitization of the three and a half million pages that make up the uh, Bund archives at YIVO, um, which includes materials uh, uh, that the Jewish Labor Bund collected about themselves um, starting in 1899, um, and those that they collected about uh, Jewish political and labor uh, movements all over the world. So um, YIVO acquired this collection from the Bund archives in 1992, and uh, that is the next, we're, we're about whatever, seven months, five months in, six months in to that project. And so that will be Talk to me in seven more years. <laughs> but but I will just say that the Vilna project was the first, first project of its scale that Evo had ever done. Um, and now we know what we're doing. And so we can do three and a half million pages, uh, hopefully in, in the same amount of time um, that we did a million and a half. Stephanie, thank you so much for your dedication honestly, um, for recognizing the importance of the research and the preservation of these materials for future generations, and also for the clarity with which you gave this comprehensive talk to us all. So thank you so much for being with us today, and, um, and thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and, you know, yeah, we're getting some lovely uh, responses in the, in the chat. I hope you see them. I do. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. And, and many more people will be watching the recording. So, you know, that's great, too. The more, the more people know about this work, the, the better. Yeah. And, thank so. you. And 